So I wanted to start this DVD off by showing you guys some of the more classic examples of the positional sacrifice in action. Uh, this section will show some of the most famous games in history and it'll introduce a lot of themes that we'll be talking about in the DVD. So I feel like it'll serve as a good foundation for the rest of the chapters and examples. Now our first game here should be well known to pretty much anyone watching this DVD. If not, then you really need to study your classics, of course. And here we have the first world champion, Willem Steinitz, playing white. Now white's position is already pretty good. His king is castled, his rooks are connected, and he has this nice lead in development. But if given time, then black is ready to play king f7 and bring his rook to e8 and start consolidating by challenging the e-file. So Steinitz realizes he needs to act quickly in order to seize the initiative, and he sacrifices a pawn with this advance d4, d5. Now he's fighting for the initiative, but I really believe that this is comes from a strategic perspective. From white's point of view, the only piece that's really not living up to its full potential is the knight on f3. You could also argue that the rook on c1 could have a better role in the game, but really it's all about this knight on f3. By pushing his pawn to d5, he's more or less obliging his opponent to capture. Black has to take with the pawn. And after knight d4, white now has this very strong square on d4 for the knight. And from here, the knight is going to e6, from where it'll be even more powerful. So this is essentially a clearance sacrifice. We're going to be using this term a lot in this DVD. A clearance sacrifice is when you give up a pawn in order to clear a square, a file, or a diagonal for one of your other pieces. Basically, the argument is that this square is more important to you than the pawn itself. And that's exactly what's going on here. White really needs to activate this knight in order to get his attack going. And so he pitches the pawn, gives black the pawn, and allows white to activate the knight. So the game continued with king f7, white dropped in with knight e6, rook c8, queen g4, and after g6, here Stein is uncorked, really one of the most beautiful combinations in chess history. Now, if you want to see how this combination played out, you should check out the PGN. It's not exactly relevant to the topic of this DVD. Of course, chess combinations are very, very beautiful, and I encourage you guys, if you haven't seen them before, to see how the rest of the game played out. Just to give you a start, in this position, Steinitz played knight to g5 check, hitting the queen on d7, and forcing black's king to go back to e8. And here he played a beautiful sacrifice, rook takes e7. I mean, really an amazing combination. If you haven't seen it before, or even if you have and you want to see it again, check out the PGN. It's fully annotated with all the key variations. But for our purposes here, I think the moment that white sacrifices the pawn is really the key moment to focus on. Because this is what gets his attack going. This clearance sacrifice to get the knight to d4, which then comes to e6 and becomes a, a total beast. Now. You could make the argument that this isn't really a positional sacrifice because white is going for the direct attack. And there is a point to that. And it's very possible that Steinitz even calculated very, very far ahead and saw that he's going to get this brilliant attack with queen g4, and he might have even anticipated the combination itself. But that's not really realistic to, let's say, mere mortals like you and me. When we're playing chess, it's often very hard to sacrifice a pawn and then calculate 12 moves ahead and then see a winning combination from there. So from our point of view, this is very much an intuitive sacrifice. We don't know exactly that the attack is going to break through, but we have this in intuitive feeling that if we put our pieces on the best squares, eventually the tactics will come up and once we reach that attack, we'll be able to find the winning combination. So from that point of view, it very much is a positional sacrifice because you're trading in a pawn in order to improve the power of your pieces. And that to me is a very strategic concept. And eventually you rely on your intuition to tell you that once you do get the knight to e6 and the queen to g4, your pieces will be so active that you'll be able to find some kind of combination in order to win the game. Our next example here comes from another world champion, Jose Capablanca, and here he's playing against the great Aaron Nimsovich. Now we're still in the opening, and here Capablanca came up with a very, very interesting pawn sacrifice. He plays the move g6, which on the whole isn't such a great move objectively, but he kind of tempts Nimsovich into grabbing a pawn on the queen side. 
So white plays knight takes c6, he takes the bait, black takes back, and queen a6. And now black has to defend the c6 pawn. If he pushes c5, after queen c6 check, black's position is going to be in a lot of trouble. He can't block with queen d7 because of the rook on a8. He'll have to play knight to d7, and after a move like knight d5, it's clear that white has a huge initiative here. The pawn on c7 is very, very unprotected. <laughs> so black played queen to d7, and this allows white's queen to come in with queen b7, rook moves to c8, queen takes a7. And then black played bishop g7, and both sides castled. And essentially what's happened here is that this was the so-called original Benko gambit. Capablanca willingly gave up one of his queenside pawns in order to get this long-term positional pressure against white's queenside. So black's plan is to bring his rooks to a8 and b8, the two open files, and then transfer his queen and transfer his knight and open up his bishop to put maximum pressure on white's queenside. So as Kasparov writes in his annotation to this game, this was kind of a new concept at the time. Nowadays, any player rated 1500 or 2000 can play the Banco Gambit and understand that White is getting huge positional pressure. In fact, we'll be talking about the Banco Gambit later on in this DVD. But this was kind of the original game that illustrated this function. That you can give up a pawn, not get any kind of immediate tactical threats, but gain these positional advantages like control over open files, putting pressure on your opponent's pawns, and so on. And this was simply too much for Nimsovich to handle. Even though White's position objectively here is fine, in fact, I believe White is probably better after a move like a4. I think this is probably the most, most accurate way for White to play the position. But White is definitely going to be under pressure here, and this pressure of always worrying that you're going to blunder some tactic because of Black's active pieces, this is really an important part of chess. So in the game, Nimsovich played queen a6. He understandably wants to just drop his queen back as soon as possible. Rook f8, queen d3, queen e6. White had to play f3 to defend the pawn, and now knight d7. And this maneuver is really what cinches it for black. The knight is coming to e5 and then to c4, where it's going to put maximum pressure on white's queenside. Like I mentioned, the rooks are also going to swing over to the open files, and white's queenside is going to be under tremendous pressure. Now the point of making the sacrifice is not necessarily to win the pawn back, but if and when black does win the pawn back, his position will then be strategically better because he's going to keep the activity of his pieces. So white played bishop d2, he's trying to develop, knight e5, queen had to move back, knight c4, and rook ab1. And here I think black already is on the verge of getting a serious advantage. Already, if black wanted to, he could have taken the bishop on d2, queen takes d2, and queen c4. And the power of black's bishop on g7 is, it just can't be overvalued here. I mean, the bishop is so strong. And now black wants to play rook b8, put his rook on b4, bring his other rook over, and just hammer on white's structure. Especially the dark squares, now that white's dark squared bishop is gone, is going to be um, black's main source of activity here. Instead, Capablanca understandably plays rook a8. He doesn't want to, let's say, cash in by taking the bishop right away. Maybe he should have, but he keeps his very strong knight on c4. White played a4. Now he chooses to take, queen takes, and his queen comes in. And in just a couple of moves, black gets a basically decisive advantage. Brings his rook to b4. And already here, after queen g5, rook a b8 was simply game over. The threat is bishop takes c3, since white's rook on b1 is hanging. And if white has to abandon the b2 pawn, then white's entire structure collapses. The knight on c3 uh, becomes very, very unstable. Capablanca gave a check on d4 first, and then played rook a b8. And Nimsovic already felt like he had to sacrifice the exchange just to relieve some of the pressure. This was a correct estimate, but after queen takes d4, white's position is still lost. Black has too much pressure on b2, and black's queen and rooks are just so active here that the game is effectively over. So this was a really, really fantastic example. It really shows you the genius of Capablanca, because he didn't learn from any books about the Benko Gambit and then try this out in his games. This is almost the concept that he personally invented. Um, to me, that's, that's very impressive that he's able to figure this out all over the board. 
Now I want to show another excerpt from one of Capablanca's games. This one is also relatively well known, one of his better end games. And here he's playing black against Janowski, and black has a lot of pressure on white's position already, um, especially along the G file. These two rooks are very strong. As you can see, the black pair of bishops are also potentially very powerful in this position, but black needs to break through. And here Capablanca plays b4, sacrificing a pawn in order to break through in white's position, and specifically activate his bishop through a4, c2, and then get the bishop to the powerful e4 square. So this is another example of a clearance sacrifice, where you're just clearing the road for your pieces. The pawn that we're giving up is just not worth as much as it is to get the bishop to e4. So white took on b4 with the pawn. He could have also taken with the bishop, then black would play bishop a4 anyways. White can trade. And if white tries to play rook c1 to prevent the bishop from coming to c2, black switches over to the b file, and now this b pawn is basically hanging and going to be lost. White has no good way of defending it. Once black wins the pawn back, of course, he'll have a winning endgame because this protected passer on c4 will be really strong. The bishop will eventually make its way to e4, and black will just have a dominating position. So, white took on b4 with the pawn. Bishop a4 was played, rook a1, bishop c2. Again, if rook c1, then black can play rook ba here, for example, to try and take the pawn on b4 and infiltrate with his rook. And black can also consider rook takes f4 check. Nice little tactic. The point is if knight takes f4, we have rook takes g1, and the rook has come in. And if king takes f4, we have bishop g5. And we win the rook on c1, and black's pieces invade white's camp. And black is just winning here. So in the game, white played rook a1, bishop c2, bishop g3, trying to plug the g file, bishop e4 check, king f2. So now white has established his bishop, he's kind of fulfilled the positional sacrifice, but what now? Or I should say black has fulfilled the positional sacrifice. He can take the pawn here, and I think that would be perfectly fine, but Capablanca finds a stronger way. He plays h5, and now he's going to break through on the g-file, the threat is h4, and white is essentially just losing a piece here. So one thing that's very important, something that we'll try to discuss a lot on the DVD, is not just the idea of sacrificing the pawn, but also the follow-up and the execution. I think that's really important because a lot of players, they might be able to see that they can sacrifice a pawn, but then they're unsure about how exactly they're going to proceed from there. How will they grow their advantage or convert it into something tangible? Of course, black's bishop on e4 looks really nice, but unless black starts winning material and breaking through, then he's not going to win the game. So this h5, h4 break was really nice, and decides the game in black's favor. White played rook a7, this prevents h4 momentarily because of the pin. Black takes on g2, rook takes g2, h4, and it's game over. Black is ready to take the bishop, and of course white's rook is hanging on g2. So white had to take on h4 with the bishop, black takes on g2 with check, king f3, rook takes h2, White won the bishop on e7, so black is only up in exchange, but black's rooks are so active, especially after rook h3 check and rook b3, that, okay, black eventually won the game very easily. Um, the point is, white has no good discoveries against the king. Black can just run along the light squares. Black's rooks are super active. I mean, okay, you guys get it. The, the game is basically over from here. Our next example is going to show a very thematic central breakthrough. Uh, here we have a very strong grandmaster, Yefim Geller, playing against Hermann Pilnik, who's another strong player from the 40s and 50s in, in chess history. So here Geller breaks in the center with e4. Now before we look at that, we should kind of take stock of the position. White has the two bishops, which are definitely an asset, but black just has a very, very strong structure in the center. Pawn on e5 and f5, these pawns are really strong and supported. Black's position is just very, very solid here. So this e4 move, it's, it's a very aggressive idea. And we're breaking in the center, we're opening the position up for the two bishops, but we see that Geller has a very, very beautiful strategic point in mind. So white trades on f6, queen takes f6, and white takes the pawn on e4. And here comes black's idea, f4. 
So he's giving up a pawn in order to establish a blockade on the dark squares. The knight is going to find a home on e5, and the white's entire position will kind of be blocked and stifled, especially this bishop on c2 is never going to have an active role ever again. When I first saw this game, it was really eye-opening for me because I had no idea that you could do this, <laughs> that you could give up a pawn just to get full control over the position. But once I kind of played through the game and started analyzing a little bit, I realized that black's position here is actually very, very easy to play, and that was kind of another point of the, of the sacrifice. Once black gets this mortal grip on the position, then black is able to play with a free hand, and we'll see how effortlessly Geller converted from here. Now, a lot of players, especially today, they realize the power of having this block hand on e5. So, a lot of players would play e5 themselves just out of instinct, just to give back the pawn but create some space for their pieces. Now, in this case, after knight e5, bishop e4, Black's position is much better. The knight on e5 is, is an absolute rock. Black has the open b file. This pawn on f4 is very strong. Black's position here is definitely better. But I think compared to the game, white would have better chances trying to hold this position than what happened in the text. So, white played rook f2. He's going to try to set up a fortress. Black plays knight e5, rook f1, and queen h4. And like I mentioned in the previous example, black's blockade is nice, but how is black actually going to win this game? Well, he's going to push the g-pawn forward, he's going to bring his rook into the game, maybe through a7 or to f7 or g7, and eventually he's going to break through on the king's side and win with a decisive attack. So I call this type of thing an active blockade. And we should make the distinction between an active blockade and let's say a passive or defensive blockade. We're going to see a lot of examples as well where one of the sides sacrifices a pawn in order to establish a fortress that the other side can't break through. So this is more of a defensive concept. Give up a pawn, create a fortress, and hold the defense. But this idea to me is very aggressive because black is giving up a pawn in order to get this huge kingside attack. And that's why I call it the active blockade. I think it's kind of a good distinction to make. So white played bishop d1. Rook f7, queen c2, g5. Black spawns are just rolling here, and the more you look at the position, the more you realize how hopeless it kind of is for white. I mean, his pieces just have no targets, he has no good pawn breaks, there's nothing for white to do. So, queen c3 was played, rook f8, and h3. Trying to prevent black from playing g4, which we'll see is, is pretty futile, it's not going to happen. White could have also tried g3, maybe this is a better choice. Here I think black drops back, queen h6, and after we trade on f4, this pawn on f4 is still super strong. The king is going to shuffle over to h8, and black is going to have huge pressure on the king side. Eventually this pawn will either go to f3, or black will shuffle his rooks to the g-file and try to checkmate white. So I think white's position here is still really bad, maybe not lost just yet, but definitely black is on the verge of winning. Instead, after h3, black played h5, so he's supporting the g4 break, bishop e2, and finally we break with g4. Of course, white could have taken the pawn on the previous move, bishop takes a4, but as you can imagine, this pawn is just inconsequential to what's going on. Black is going to break through on the king side and just checkmate white. So g4, bishop d1 for example, and I think there's a lot of ways I was analyzing a little bit. I think knight g6 is an interesting idea. The point being to play f3, bring the knight to f4, and black will get a decisive attack with his knight joining the game. Uh, instead, white played bishop e2, and Geller finally breaks with g4. Now the, the game is basically lost. The black is starting to play f3, and then open the g-file, and <laughs> start attacking white's king. If white takes on g4, of course we recapture, and then we can play g3 or rook h7 and give mate on the h-file. So Pilnik here tried rook takes f4. It's kind of a decent try, but tactically it just doesn't work out. So white temporarily sacrifices a rook, and the idea is to play g3 and try to win the rook back. Black had a lot of ways to win from here. Um, I think one of the simplest was to play knight f3 check, which happened in the game. Also good is queen takes h3, and the point being when white takes the rook, black just plays g3, 
and white has no defense to queen h2 and is just going to be mate in a couple of moves. Geller played knight f3 check which also wins after king f2, queen takes h3, take on f4, g3 check, king takes f3, g2, and after queen h2 it's clear that black's pawn is going to queen next move. Okay, maybe this wasn't the simplest win, but it definitely was good enough. So, like I mentioned, when I saw this game with this e4 break, I was really stunned that someone could go for this. But looking back at it now, it's, it's kind of clear to see the idea. The point is, black trades the dark squared bishops, and he leaves white with a terrible light squared bishop. He gets this active blockade going, and black's position just becomes phenomenal. Uh, I think, in essence, this is really a true strategic sacrifice, and hopefully... You know, you should be able to ask yourself, would you be able to play like this during the game? And I hope that most of you at this point will say yes. If not, we'll see more examples in later chapters of this kind of active blockade, showing you some different ideas and different ways to break through and all that. Our next example here takes place from the Olympiad in 1960. This is another well-known game. And here we have Jonathan Penrose, English Grandmaster, playing against great world champion Mikhail Tall. And here Penrose plays what's become a very, very thematic sacrifice uh, for white in a Benoni type of position. That's with this pawn structure of d5, e4, f4 against d6 and c5, or in this case, c4. Now, white's plan in this position is usually to try and break through with either e5 or f5. And the point is white has more space on the king side, his pieces are quite well placed, and if white can open the king side up, a lot of times he can get a really strong attack. But in this case, if white plays the move f5, this comes with a very serious strategic concession in that he gives up the e5 square, usually for black's knight, sometimes for the bishop as well. And this knight on e5 is very, very strong. Of course, we saw this knight in the previous game, but in this position, it's doing both an active role, it's supporting knight d3, and it's also covering f7, which is black's main weakness in the position, and it's just really, really giving black a very, very nice position here. So sometimes white plays f5 and tries to break through on the king side anyways, willingly giving up this square on e5 for the knight, but in this case, Penrose came up with a really, really nice sacrifice, starting with the move e5. Now black was more or less forced to take on e5, and white's idea is to play f5. And as you might start to realize, the point of white's sacrifice is to block black's pieces from being able to use this e5 square. So not only are we going to get this very, very nice e4 square for white's knight, we're also preventing black from establishing his knight on e5, which would give black a very secure position. So this is another kind of active blockade, uh, except this time White's idea is not going to be to push the pawns on the king side, but rather to open the king side and try to give mate with using his pieces. And in my eyes, this sacrifice is as much about getting the e4 square for the knight as it is about blocking black's pieces from being able to use the e5 square. Now, if black didn't capture on e5 the move previously, white would be able to put his knight on e4 and put a lot of pressure on the d6 pawn. So eventually black would be more or less forced to take on e5 and white would establish this very very nice blockade with f5 and get this powerful kingside attack. Now there's a lot of ideas here for white. Right away his threat is to take on g6 and infiltrate with the queen with queen f7 check. If black plays a move like rook f8, white has a really nice tactic here starting with the move f6. So we're hitting the bishop on g7, of course, and the point is, if black takes the pawn, then black's knight on d7 is overloaded, protecting everything in black's position, and after bishop takes c5, white is winning a piece. Queen c5, we trade queens, the knight has to leave the protection of the bishop, and rook takes f6, white is up a piece for not a whole lot of compensation. Because of this, black would have to drop back with bishop h8, but now this pawn on f6 is very, very strong, and white can win here with a direct attack. The move d6 is a really nice resource. The point is, if queen takes d6, white jumps in with knight f5. Hitting the queen and threatening knight e7 check, and if black takes the knight on f5, we have queen g3 check, which just wins the game. It leads to mate. 
So after d6, black would not be able to take this pawn either. He'd have to go back with queen d8. And after knight d5, I think it's basically time to resign. This knight is coming to e7 with really devastating effect. So rook f8, for that reason, wasn't possible. Tall instead played bishop b7. And Penrose supports his d5 pawn with rook ad1. Now the thing about this kind of sacrifice is that you don't always have to try and capitalize on it very, very quickly. Once you've established this grip on the position, a lot of times the best thing you can do is just improve your pieces and, as Nimsevich would say, overprotect the most important squares. Here White is simply lining his rook up on the d-file, he's supporting this advanced d6 if he wants, but really he's just securing the d5 outpost for his knight in the future. And of course White reserves the right to play knight e4 in any moment and start bringing in his pieces into the king side. I was analyzing a little bit and it turns out that white was already winning with f takes g6, h take, or f takes g6 again, and now a sacrifice bishop takes g6. After black takes, white comes in with the queen on f7, and if king h8, we play queen takes g6, followed by knight f5, rook f7 is also threatened, and white's attack here is decisive. Or if black played king h7, then white wins with a really nice knight h5. Black is forced to take, and after rook f5, black is again losing everything with rook takes h5 coming next. So that already shows you just the potential of white's attack here. As soon as he opens up, let's say, this diagonal for the bishop, which was another diagonal he cleared with this e4, e5 break, and of course the fact that white's knights suddenly get all this activity. After rook ad1, tall played bishop a8. And with knight e4, it's clear that white was starting to establish his grip on the position, and Penrose ended up winning. If you want to see the rest of this game, I encourage you to check out the PGN. Um, this game was really famous, and we'll see this e4, e5 break in nowadays in a lot of games. It's a very, very common idea in the Benoni. This was one of the first games to feature this break. I was actually able to find a game earlier that we'll see later on where white executed the same break, but this game was really kind of what made this idea and this theme very famous. Our next example here again features Tall as the victim. He's playing black against Lev Poligayevsky, another very, very strong Russian grandmaster. Now this game hopefully is well known to most of you. In this position, Poligayevsky played d5, breaking in the center, and the point is that after e takes d5, he plays e5. Now this definitely resembles the previous game and another very, very famous example of this kind of, let's call it a clearance sacrifice because we're clearing the d4 square, we're opening up the bishop with e4, e5, and it's also kind of a blockading sacrifice because now white gets the d4 square for the knight, black's bishop on b7 ends up being extremely passive, and white's bishop on d3, as you know if you've seen this game before, is very, very promisingly opened up against this h7 pawn. So in the game, black played knight c4, activating the knight, White played queen f4, and after knight b2, which is definitely the critical test of white's position, uh, hitting the rook on d1, hitting the bishop on d3, white uncorked this sacrifice, bishop takes h7 check, which is absolutely crushing. Now the story goes was that this was all preparation by Poligayevsky, and back then there were no computers, there were no engines, so meaning he analyzed this by hand using <laughs> his own brain, which to me is pretty remarkable because his analysis was very, very accurate, and indeed this is a winning sacrifice for white. After king takes h7, knight g5 check, black can't go back to g8 because of queen h4, and we have mate coming on the h-file very soon. Black played king g6, and here white plays the only winning move, which I believe was still preparation, h4. Now white's idea is to challenge the black king even more with pawn to h5, but first white is going to set it up with the move rook to d4, then push his pawn to h5, bring his queen over to h4, and start mating the black king. There's lots of nice lines here, for example if black plays f5, then white plays rook d4 again with the same idea, and this is going to lead to mate. White also has knight e6 at some point if he wants to win back some material. In the game, Tall played rook c4, challenging the queen. And rook d4 here is still very, very strong. 
The point is that if black trades on d4, we take on d4 with the queen, the knight on b2 is hanging, and once the knight moves, white gets access to this d3 check, queen d3 check, and black's king is really close to getting mated. If he goes to the h file, queen h7 is already game over, and after f5, of course, very common theme in this Greek gift sacrifice, white takes on passant, opens up the queen, and black's king is simply too vulnerable to survive here. Instead, in the game, Poligarevsky played h5, and this is really strong because if king takes h5, white has g4 check, king g6, queen f5, and black is going to get mated very soon. Seems like king h6, this is just leading to immediate mate. Whenever the king comes towards our position, it's, it's just always going to be checkmate one way or another. <laughs> So after h5, black did not take, he played king h6, white took on f7 with a double check, king h7, queen f5, king g8. And after e6, it's clear that white's attack is simply very, very strong. He's starting e7, among other things, and black ended up losing in just a couple of moves. So this d5 break, this is another very, very nice example of the positional sacrifice, which then leads to, let's say, a dynamic advantage. Once white gets the pawn to e5, it's clear that white has a very, very strong initiative in this position, but still, to my eyes, this sacrifice comes from strategic considerations. Like I mentioned before, it's as much about activating white's pieces as it is about restricting black's pieces in the position. And that's to me what makes it a true positional sacrifice, is that we're very concerned with the power of our pieces and the restriction of our enemy pieces. With that, we'll wrap up our first video here. I hope this gave you guys a very nice survey of some of the most classic games featuring positional sacrifices, like I've mentioned like six times now. <laughs> if you wanna see the full game and all of the annotations, do check out the PGN. I think it'll really help with your retention of the material and it'll get your brain more familiar with a lot of these themes as we work through uh, the rest of this DVD. Until next time, take care.